Good morning again, everyone. We're going to get off the topic of EKGs. First of all, I just want to congratulate Aaron. I think Aaron really is the best emergency ortho speaker in our specialty. So it's really, really great to have him here. He's also the tallest Indian I know. So it's like, <laughs> really pisses me off. Anyway, so. <laughs> OK. Uh, this past fall, the American College of Emergency Physicians, ASEP, published a clinical policy on chest pain that I believe is a real game changer in our specialty in terms of how we evaluate and manage patients with chest pain. So I wanted to get into that just a little bit. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip through the case, but essentially, think about the last time you saw a low-risk type of chest pain. It's not a slam dunk admission, diaphoresis, chest pressure, radiating down the arm, and so on. It's also not a person who got punched in the chest, and clearly non-cardiac, but that person that you have just some slight qualms about. For the past 20 years, the standard evaluation that we've been held to, in fact, you might even say the standard of care, and in the men mal cases, the standard of care that would always be thrown at us is summarized in this document, which is a scientific statement published by the American Heart Association. This is from 2010, but essentially it's a summary of what we've been told you're supposed to do with patients that have so-called low-risk chest pain. I highlight the first author's name here, Amsterdam. We'll talk about why that is, and I'll blow parts of this up. Essentially, what they said is that when you have a low-risk patient that you have some concern, it's not a clear-cut go-home, not a slam-dunk admission, what they said that we're supposed to do is to get serial EKGs, serial markers, and then if those are all negative, you don't send them home yet. Instead, what they said is that you need to send them for some type of provocative test, either myocardial perfusion imaging, which is top left, which means sestamibi, not many people can do sestamibi. More commonly, what they would say is get a stress test or coronary CTA. And if the coronary CTA is negative or the test, maybe if you have it, if those are negative, then you get to send them home. Now I know that in many people's practice, we do serial EKG, serial enzymes, and then we're sending patients home. And that's probably reasonable care, but that's not, that wasn't the standard of care, which means if you ended up having a bad outcome and it went to, to litigation, this is the article that the attorneys would typically pull, and they would say, you didn't follow this national standard of care. Now, I didn't agree with this. A lot of people didn't agree with this. We even talked about this in previous Essentials courses, but this is the standard under which we were held. You cannot discharge a patient home until after their provocative test or coronary CTA or sestamibi for the past couple of decades. Well, we've been able to get beyond that, beyond the provocative test now because of this clinical policy. The guidelines were always used consistently over and over as a source of litigation. But there's now literature and a clinical policy saying that, you know what? There's literature that says provocative testing or coronary CTA is unnecessary and in fact may actually be harmful in these low-risk patients. So first question here, what's the purpose of doing a provocative test in the first place in these low-risk patients? What, what, why were we doing this in the first place? The idea was that if you put somebody on a treadmill and stress them and they end up with positive EKG changes or chest pain, what you're doing is you're trying to identify patients that have big coronary lesions and then if they have a positive stress test, they would go on to get intervention, a cath. And the idea was that if you send a patient for a cath and a stent or cabbage, that that patient was going to have a better outcome. They would have fewer major adverse cardiac events, MACE, that's what MACE stands for, major adverse cardiac events over the next few months or a year, right? If I told you that sending a patient for a cath is not gonna improve their outcome, I think we'd all agree that it's a waste of time. Why would you send somebody for a cath if you know it's not gonna change their outcome? Right? You're just subjecting them to invasive procedures with all the risks. And then taking a step back, if a cath is not going to do any good, why bother doing the stress test? Because the whole purpose of doing the stress test is to figure out who needs to get a cath. Well, again, what if it turns out that there's literature saying that PCI or even bypass in low-risk patients does not improve outcomes? Why are we doing it? Would you still want to do that intervention? Well, it turns out that we've now got increasing literature. These are just a couple of the dozens of articles that have been coming out over about the past seven or eight years showing that once you rule patients out, 
with low risk chest pain. Again, not the easy go home, not the easy admissions, but these low risk patients. The studies are consistently saying that in low risk populations, the provocative test and the coronary CTA do not improve one month or one year outcomes. There's, there is an increased length of stay, increased cost, increased subsequent invasive procedures when we do the prov provocative test, but no reduction in one month or one year adverse events. So why are we doing this? So multiple articles, I'm just gonna flash these articles have been coming out and editorials have been coming out saying, you know what? If you have a low risk patient, don't do the provocative test or coronary CTA because all you're doing is increasing invasive procedures with no improvement in one year outcome. Take a look at the name up here, Ezra Amsterdam. He's the same person who was first author in that guideline I showed you. Now he's writing an editorial saying, you know what, based on the newest literature, don't do the provocative test if they're low risk. If they're low risk, it's worse to do the provocative test. Yet another article and another article saying that provocative testing doesn't predict which patients need the better outcome. Same thing for coronary CTA, I'll blow this up. The conclusion from this, this best evidence article on coronary CTA, routine coronary CTA in low risk patients increases length of stay, increased cost, increased subsequent cath without improving the rate of major adverse cardiac event at a year. So why is this happening? I thought provocative testing was like the gold standard. We've all, well, I think we all know that coronary CTA and provocative testing is not 100% sensitive, but what I didn't know is that coronary CTA and provocative testing have rotten specificity also. Take a look at some of these numbers. The specificity is really bad, 75 to 80%. What that means is that when you send patients for provocative testing coronary CTA, there's actually a relatively high false positive rate. And if you wanna put some numbers on this, here's the numbers you need to know. If your risk of having an adverse outcome, if your risk of ruling in for ACS is less than 2%, you're more likely to get a false positive than a true positive provocative test or coronary CTA. And what happens? when you use a low specificity test in a low risk population, you get a lot of false positives. And what happens if you get a false positive stress test or coronary CTA, what do you do with that patient? They go for cath. And now you've just subjected this person who's got nothing to an invasive procedure with complications. What happens if they have a false positive cath? Does that ever happen? Absolutely. Now they're going for unnecessary stenting, a lifetime of Plavix or other bad medications or even bypass surgery. Studies have shown that unnecessary stress testing increases cath and even bypass surgery without an improvement in one year outcome. All right, so here's the ASAP clinical policy and just skipping to the chase, the key thing, there's different questions they ask in this policy, but I think the game changer part of this is highlighted up here. Take a look at the bottom. Many patients are receiving extensive diagnostic workups for ACS in which harms exceed the benefit. And the top highlighted part is that 2% figure I mentioned before. Once again, if the likelihood your patient is gonna rule in for ACS is 2% or less, you're more likely to be inducing harm by sending them for the provocative test or coronary CTA. And so ASEP has finally, for the first time ever, we have a national organization that has stepped up and said, you know what? Not only do you not need to do the stress test, but they've actually taken a step further and said, don't do the stress test if your patient has low risk for ACS, 2% or less. Now the next question that you must be asking is, is there a way of predicting when somebody has a 2% risk or less? Any ideas? The hard score, the hard score, exactly. When somebody has, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail, we've got a couple speakers, including the queen of hearts, Barbara Backus, right? The person who created the heart score is here in just a few minutes. When you apply the heart score to these patients, if their heart score is three or less, you've just determined that they have a 2% or less rate risk of adverse event at about four to six weeks. There's some protocols that say, you know what, instead of just getting a troponin now, let's get a troponin now and repeat it in three hours. And if that stays negative, your risk drops from under two to under 1%. 
bottom line is when people have low risk, we need to get away from this routine use of provocative testing or coronary CTA. The heart score has been endorsed by AHA. It's in the ACLS manual, multiple journals. It's endorsed by the ASAP clinical policy as well. And so the question that we all worry about, oh my gosh, if I don't send this person for a provocative test and they happen to be one of that 1% that has an adverse outcome, is this defensible? And I'm here to tell you that it absolutely is because we now have a national clinical policy. The largest emergency medicine organization in the world has stepped up and said, if somebody has low risk, you are entirely within the standard of care by not sending them for that mandated provocative test. And so coming up, we're going to hear a lot more about the heart score. That's the game changer. Thanks a lot.